the start of chapter 15 that's in unit 6. Uh, previously we had simple harmonic motion. We're now going to be talking about uh, waves in a general nature and a bit of sound. And then next chapter, chapter 16, will be wave interference. Uh, I will say that this starts um, a kind of a section that's a little bit foreign to us in a way because uh, it's a concentration more on concept than it is on equations or anything else like that. There are very few equations and there actually are things called vocabulary terms that we need to know in order to uh, do this successfully. So uh, let's get started. Uh, first, simple harmonic motion. Uh, we did things that looked like uh, waves as far as the way that they moved. Uh, they didn't really look like waves like you would think about a uh, like a pond or anything like we see here. I mean, this is a wave, right? Um, it's a wave. But we had things that went up and down. But if you looked at their time, you know, then essentially we said, oh, okay, well, it went up, slowed down, slowed down on the way, you know, and it's, and we talked about as fast as the slowest point, all these kind of things like that. So um, in this case, we were going to, uh, uh, be looking at actual things that move like waves, like a wave on a string or an ocean wave or something else like that. I mean, these are actual waves, and you look at them, they are actual, you know, sine waves. So, first let's separate out uh, the fact that we are going to just do this stuff, okay? All right, we're only doing mechanical waves. There are plenty of waves in nature and physics. Electromagnetic waves. This is the entire spectrum. Actually, we'll do this. We'll talk about this because it's fun. It's one of my favorite things. We'll talk about it after the AP exam. Um, you know, visible light, radio, x-rays, all these things like that. You have things that have a wave-like uh, nature when they move. Electrons have that. Uh, you can start adding some neat things that we just, you know, found out about, like, you know, gravity waves and, um, you know, things like that. The uh, particle wave duality. Uh, you know, electrons, again, you know, when they go around their orbital shells, it's not really shells, they're standing waves and all kinds of stuff. But we're going to focus on mechanical waves right here and just these right here. So sound, thing, waves on string, water waves, uh, all these things that we can kind of describe in a simple nature. Now, these end up um, applying a whole bunch to everything else, but, you know, this is going to be our introduction here. First, what is a mechanical wave? Well, the key thing is that a mechanical wave requires a substance. Some, it must move through something. Uh, we call that substance a medium. All right, a medium. It must travel through a medium. No medium, no mechanical wave. All right, if a mechanical wave is traveling and then it, you know, enters something that is not, does not have a medium, then there is no uh, more wave. Example of that would be um, a lack of a medium would be a vacuum. There is no medium there. Uh, but for sound, things something like this, you know, we have a medium uh, that is for sound uh, called the air. All right, that air could be, that's air is a generic term for any kind of mixtures, but it could be, you know, oxygen, nitrogen, anything else, helium. Um, and uh, depending on this, changes some properties. Um, okay, so you must have a medium. Check one, step one. Step two, you must have a disturbance, all right? Something that is going to disturb the medium, all right? So here I have water. Water is my medium, all right? And then what probably came and disturbed it? Well, some kid, you know, came and, you know, threw a rock down and, you know, into the, into the pond on a nice clear day and it disturbed the medium. So what happened from there? you had a wave traveling out in all directions here, okay? We say a wave propagates out, you know, right? So um, it travels outward, okay, at a wave speed, a certain speed. In this direction goes a certain speed, that direction, certain speed, that direction, so on, so on, so on, okay? One of the key concepts here is the disturbance transfers energy the energy from that disturbance, from that splash, transfers outward. The medium does not. For example, if you have a big pond like here, you know, something like that, you know, some big pond, and some kid, you know, drops a rock in right here and makes this big uh, splash. So these ripples go out like this, 
you know, every direction, and it's a huge splash that makes it all the way down to the other end. Now, the water from here did not travel all the way down this way. The water did not travel out. It's the energy from that disturbance that traveled outwards, right? That is the only thing. In the same way, right, in the same way that sound, when you hear my voice in the classroom, you hear the energy of my voice right, that con continues through. The air that comes out of my throat, right, is not uh, being transferred around the room. It's the energy from my voice that gets transferred around. Okay, so um, we'll get more, uh, talk more about that a little bit later. Two types of mechanical waves. One is transverse waves. Another one is longitudinal waves. Okay, we are going, this is where you have to know some vocabulary. We're first going to talk about transverse waves. This is first, and then we'll do second here. Transverse waves. Particles of the medium move perpendicular to the motion of the wave. So, for example, here, the wave can move to the right. But if I were to track, you know, as this, uh, as this uh, rope, you know, this wave comes down the rope, all right, if I were to track this little bit of rope, I would not see that rope shooting off, that little piece of rope, that little particle of rope right there. It wouldn't shoot off this way. What would it do? It would actually rise when the wave comes in, and then it would fall when it comes back down, okay? It would rise up and fall down. Now, I have this picture here for a reason. This is a stadium wave, right? So what does this man do? When the wave comes, he rises straight up and then comes right back down to where he was. This man did not stand up and start running around the stadium, you know, all the way around the stadium with that, uh, with that wave. His motion was up and down, even though the, the, the wave was moving, you know, right or left or whatever. His motion was up and down, perpendicular to the motion of the wave, okay? That's the key thing. So, for example, wave on a string here. The, wave, the string moves up and down. Uh, electromagnetic waves are technically uh, uh, transverse. Uh, ocean waves also. Well, uh, let's just think it a little bit easier. Uh, you go fishing, all right, so here's your... Here's your pond here, and here's your bobber, half in, half out of the water, coming down to your hook, and you know you got your worm, all that kind of stuff. And then here you got it connected, and here just goes back up to it. Now, what happens is a you know a boat or something passes, and a wave comes. Well, when it does this, what does your bobber do? It doesn't go shooting off like this. It actually just goes up, and then back down. In the same way, like the a little this little piece of Water right here goes up with it and then right back down. Okay, maybe a little bit it will push to the left over time with wind or something else like that. But um, you know, this is generally what we're what we're talking about here. So let's go through a simulation here and um, and I'll show you some more details on this. Okay, load up here. Come to my simulation. So here's my simulation of a of a wave here. Um, so I have a basin here which is just water in a tub and I have my sink so I can actually turn on water for a second just one little bit and oops, let me try that again pulse there we go now it's moving up looks like things are running a little slow right now on my computer but uh, so I do another pulse here, and again the water drops, and we got another wave that comes out like this. So if I were to actually add a little detector here that could see the amplitude, see the disturbance, let's try to track this. All right. So right now everything is perfectly flat. As time goes on, everything is perfectly flat, and now I'm going to send a pulse out, drop a drop a drop of water, and you can see how this wave front comes through. It makes a dip and then a rise again and then it returns back. All right. So this actually this water level went up and then right back down. That is an example of a transverse wave. I can turn it on 
as a permanent basis here. And you can see the disturbances are now continue. And actually, I can turn up the frequency, you know, make it happen more often. Okay, and so what I see here is that water level goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down, and that's just fine. Okay, um, so this is an example there for um, for water. Okay, so let's try something a little bit different, and let's go to sound. So sound is a bit different. Um, let me turn off the speaker here. Uh, if I send a pulse of sound outwards, do another pulse here, you can see the wave in here travel outwards. Okay. Now, but if I actually looked at the particles, what are the particles doing? All right. Now, these particles of air bouncing around, they got a certain amount of energy, something else like that. But let's see, I give it a pulse. Uh, let's see, maybe I need. Well, you can kind of see. Anyway, okay, now you can see. Yeah, yeah. So here it goes. You see right there? See they bunch together? They bunch together like this. Let me send out another pulse. Or just turn it on. Yeah, I'll just turn it on like this. Turn up the frequency a little bit. There you go. So now it goes in and out. I can actually see them bunch together right here. All right, and they'll bunch together in these wave fronts right here as they go out. Now, if you really look at them, like this one right here, as that wave front comes in, it's moving like this. It's moving, let's say, right and left. Well, what direction is the wave moving right here? Well, the wave is also moving, um, you know, this way, you know, this way too. And this little piece of particle is moving right and left. Okay, you see that, how they kind of bunch right there? And they're not really, you know, shifting. I mean, this guy is just kind of going back and forth, back and forth. So this is an example of a longitudinal wave, which is not transverse was up and down when something goes right and left, or left and right when something goes up and down, whatever. It has to be perpendicular. Here, longitudinal means in the same direction, in the same direction. So that's actually different. That's different. So let's go to that longitudinal wave slide here and, uh, and look at that. So if you're not a transverse wave, then you are, uh, sorry, mechanical wave, then you are a longitudinal wave. Particles of the medium move parallel to the uh, motion of the wave. So again, a perfect example of this is sound, All right? The sound wave travels this way at some speed. This little particle right here goes like this. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't make this huge, you know, thing with it. It just goes right and left a little bit. All right, so it just goes right and left as these waves pass uh, by. So sound is a longitudinal wave right there. These are also called pressure waves because that's really what sound is. It's a high pressure and then a low pressure and a high pressure and then a low pressure, high pressure, low pressure. All right, high density, low density, also called density waves also. I call it a bunch of things. Uh, another example I'll show in class, if you have a slinky, is that if you push the slinky along the way, you'll see a area of density move down the slinky, all right? So again, this little piece of the slinky is not moving that way. It's just this energy with it in a dense area that moves out like that, okay? So this is a longitudinal wave right here. And again, the, the individual directions of the particles is in the same direction as the direction of the wave. Wave speed. Um, the key thing I want to tell you right here is this. This is what you have to know the most. Very important. The wave speed is a property of the medium. The wave speed is a property of the medium. If I want to change a wave speed, I must change the medium. So some examples, if I want to make a wave travel down a string more in order to get that wave speed uh, greater, I have to do one of two things. I have to increase the tension 
or decrease. This is something. This is a mass uh, uh, mass length uh, density or dense uh, length. I can't remember, but it's basically the um, uh, the you know the the mass per meter. It doesn't quite make sense. Uh, mass per length. All right. Uh, mass per length of the thing. So um, it's a little bit confusing there, but let's say, uh, so I can increase the tension or decrease this. I can make it a, a lower mass per length, which means a thinner wire, a thinner string or something else like that. But uh, for, I, I guess for the AP exam, you don't need to know this. We're not gonna practice calculating this. Um, but probably knowing that a tension, a greater tension in a string causes a higher wave speed for a string or a wire, a guitar string, you know, I think is probably important. And you, if you play guitar, you know that if you, if you, you know, tune the guitar, you increase that tension, you get a higher pitch, which actually comes, you know, from a higher velocity here. Uh, also, a thinner wire has a higher pitch, which we'll tie into later. For air, all right. Um, when we say the speed of sound is roughly 343 meters per second, we say roughly because it depends on a few things. One is the, um, oh, I can't remember what this is. It's like, maybe it's not quite a density thing, but uh, this is R constant, and this is the temperature of the air, and this is the molar mass of the medium. Um, yeah, so, um, and this is another value set by the medium here, but probably the more important one to think about is this temperature. You can actually uh, change the temperature of medium and you change the speed of sound. So you increase the temperature of medium and the speed of sound also you know increases which has effects uh, too. Um, this comes from like uh, you know instrument tuning and things like that actually you know when you have different temperatures even different humidities um, you know they sound a little bit different for different reasons. Uh, for light well it's just one constant Three times in eight meters per second, um, and that's that's what it is. That is for the speed of light uh, in a vacuum or something else like that. So, part of, key thing here is that if I want to increase this this speed of a wave, I can increase the tension. Uh, if I uh, for a string or something else like that, and I can increase the temperature for air or something like that. Uh, here are some wave speeds. Um, again, the medium sets it so air. Depending on the temperature, you increase the temperature, you increase the speed. Uh, you change the medium to helium instead of air, and you get an even higher speed, which makes your voice change. Um, you know, alcohol, water, uh, human tissue, lead, all the way down. You know, again, the more denser the kind of material, or really the molar mass or whatever, um, the greater the effect. So you get down to you know metals, and they have you know a large um, speed, denser, and even you know our, one of our denser things is diamond. And you get a you know twelve thousand uh, meters per second. So if you had a uh, if you had a huge diamond that was um, twelve kilometers, which would be about uh, what seven miles long, um, then yeah, you can you could speak from one end to the other and it would travel um, in one second, which seems a little strange. Okay, um, now let's take. Back in chapter 14, we looked at motion as a function of time. So basically, when I uh, hung a you know, mass here from a spring, we let it go up and down like this. You know, Oh, we said, okay, well, it's position as a function of time. We had this little cosine, all, all that kind of stuff. And we basically looked like, oh, okay, it's like this, it's like this. All right. So this is position as a function of time. That's what we looked at. Now, instead of focusing as tracking this as a function of time and tracking like one dimension, we're actually just gonna you know completely look at something different. We're gonna focus instead on a single instant and look at y as a function of position. So we have just a standard y and x graph here. So you know, for example, if I had a wave. Um, Here's a string, and there was a wave that was traveling down the string like this, right? And here's my hand right here, and maybe it's attached to a wall right here, right? I'm just gonna, you know, if I, you know, somewhere, somewhere in the past had to vibrate this up and down, but um, basically I'm gonna say this is my snapshot right here. 
it's called a snapshot graph actually. You know, this is my y axis here, and this is my x. And I'm just going to plot, you know, my x and y here. All right, so just y and x, and it's like a snapshot, like a picture. Like this is just what we see versus this, which is tracking it as time goes on, which is kind of different different ways of looking at things. Okay, so we're just going to take a snapshot graph here and go with that. Uh, we can also track individual particles over time and this goes back to what we were kind of doing a history graph so what's its vertical position versus time that's more like what we're doing chapter 14 with the history graph so here if I take a particular so right here here's a uh, you imagine this is kind of like a rope I know it has a curve you know it has a sharp point right there um, but you know this is a rope and so I have a certain particle right here actually I'm um, sorry let me clean it up. So I have a particle right here. It was down at the equilibrium, but as this wave came in, it was it rose up like this. So at time equals one, it's at this height. Okay. So at time equals one, it's at that height. All right. So this is showing that time equals one, it's at that height. Uh, before that, it was back at zeros before that wave got here. Now, as the wave goes by, and this is going further into the future, it was over here, and now it's up here a little bit later. Again, the same position here. So that is now higher, and that's shown right here. And then as the wave continu uh, continues to pass by, it actually will get lower. And again, this is time three, this is time two. And at time four, all the way out here, it's the wave's completely passed, and it's now, it's now gone by. So this is, this is the... Um, history graph. Okay, this is the history graph. All right, you can take individuals, these are snapshots, all right? You can take individual snapshots and create a history. Now what you notice about this the way that this wave looks, right? And the way that this wave looks, right? They're actually swaps. Right? So this came to this side and that came to that side. They're swaps. Remember, so look right here, it slowly goes up and then it comes down. I'm sorry, it goes up quick and then it comes down. Here, it goes up quick and then it comes down in the opposite manner. All right. Um, so this is a graph of y, the vertical position versus time. Okay, if I take um, my snapshot graph and I look at this, um, and again, if I went back to... Uh, you know, a, you know, an ocean wave or something else like that, uh, I would see sinusoidal motion, like we see here, right? Um, and the individual particles would move up and down just like simple harmonic motion like that. So we're going to start adding terms to this, right? Here's my maximum. First one is amplitude. We know that. Our maximum value from equilibrium. It's the same definition, you know, from the maximum displacement maximum displacement from equilibrium, right? Uh, but I have to remember that this is an amplitude and this is an amplitude. Yes, it's down negative. This is not the amp... Uh, sorry. This all the way down to here is not the amplitude. That is actually two times the amplitude. All right, so we can't... Let's, let's not even... Let's go ahead and erase that. Let's just ignore that. The amplitude is from equilibrium to uh, the highest or lowest position. Okay, the next term, which goes into vocab vocabulary, is crest. Crest is the high point of a wave. So this is a crest, that is a crest, this is a crest. It's a crest right there, too. All right, so this is one, two, three, four crests right there. It's where your y position is at a maximum, you're, you know, at your positive amp amplitude. Trough is a low point. This is a trough, that is a trough, that is a trough, that is a trough. All right, four troughs. And uh, so we'll get back to here, okay? And so my troughs are where you have a negative amplitude down here. So crest, trough, uh, this is my equilibrium position here, it's not labeled. Um, Essentially, if the if the if this is water waves, if the there were no waves at all, then basically my water level would be right here, right in that equilibrium position right there. 
Uh, wavelength uh, is the distance between crest to crest or trough to trough. It is the distance, uh, physical distance between cycles, right? So it could also be equilibrium to equilibrium and back to equilibrium. So it could be this too. This is also one wavelength. And we use the symbol lambda here for wavelength, okay? So symbol lambda for wavelength. Um, but I like to say crest to crest or trough to trough. It's easier to remember because here you have to remember that it goes through equilibrium uh, once and then it comes back again. All right, now if I have all this, I can actually track the uh, speed, position, everything else of a wave a little bit more accurately. So we had this before from last chapter, and we can actually take it all the way to this. We have position y as a function of time. So now it actually has, uh, oh sorry, position y as a function of x and time, and we can generate this, so I have two functions here, but you know, in this class, we're not going to be uh, doing that. We're, we're just gonna uh, skip that, all right? This is not gonna be on the AP exam. This is going to be on the AP exam right here, uh, this, this equation, but this kind of understanding, I, I can't remember if you all did that in, in algebra three or not, but either way, um, that's, that's not gonna be required. Now, you may have it in other classes if you do um, some other physics or engineering. So I said that the, um, the speed is set by the medium. That is still true, all right? So this speed is the medium speed set by the medium. You cannot change that unless you change your medium, okay? And so I can calculate uh, from here, actually, let, let me rearrange it. I, I like this equation. This is much more functional here, that the wavelength is equal to the speed through the medium of a wave divided by the frequency. And why do I like this? This is set by the medium, okay? The frequency is set by the disturbance. So like we had in that, um, that basin of water, you know, that disturbance is the, uh, the rate at which the drops hit the water. That's set by the disturbance. You cannot change that. But what does change in response to these two things, which don't change unless you change the medium or change your rate, and what changes is the wavelength. So the wavelength changes. The frequency and the velocity do not, all right? So, but I also can, if I measure a certain wavelength and I know a certain frequency, I can actually find the speed through the medium and any other combination like that. So we can actually use this. This is actually on your yellow sheet. So make sure you know where it is and how to use it, yellow sheet. Okay. Um, like we said before, sound is a longitudinal wave, and sound is probably one of our more important waves that we're going to study. Waves on a string are nice, but sound is, um, has uh, uh, relevance to us, of course, as one of our senses. Sound is a longitudinal wave, which means it is a pressure wave. There are areas of compressed air, and there's areas with low-density air. Uh, we call the compressed air, the high-density things, compressions, and that makes sense. The low-density areas are called rarefactions, right? Not a typical word that we, you know, know or think of, but those, that's the other thing. So, so I have a compression here. I have a, um, actually, let me uh, erase that a bit, because I would like to say this, that I have a, High pressure area here, which is a compression. I have a low pressure area here. I have a high pressure area here, low pressure area here, high pressure, low pressure. In between, I have just a normal pressure. All right. And there's a gradual shift from here to here and a gradual shift, you know, back and so on and so on. So what I see 
is that if I were to plot uh, for any piece of air, let's just take I you know I take any um, uh, well, it's, it's, this is a snapshot here. So if I look at you know uh, the air right here, I see that I have a high pressure area, right, and I have a low pressure area. High pressure, low pressure, in the same kind of pattern, and uh, they have areas where in between everything is normal the way it is. And so this is what how a um, a graph of a uh, longitudinal wave or sound wave looks, right? Because you have high density areas, low densities. Key thing is that compressions corresponds to crests. High pressure. Rarefactions, oops, wrong way. Uh, rarefactions um, correspond to troughs. Okay. Low pressure. High pressure, low pressure. In between there's a moderate pressure. So somewhere right here, you know, there's a medium pressure, uh, which is fine. Uh, pressure waves or density waves are the other waves. So how is this actually generated? Well, the speaker, well, it shows it, you know, shifting like this, but what the speaker does is it has a cone, and that cone moves in and out like this, right? A little electromagnetic driver shifts it. When it moves out, it pushes this air forward, right? And creates a high-pressure front that then moves outwards itself. And when it pulls backwards, it creates a low-pressure area and then back and done. Now it can do that several thousand times per second and that's okay, which is pretty pretty amazing. Um, density pressure of the medium falls as a sinusoidal pattern as a wave it passes again. It doesn't immediately go, it doesn't go like this, right? It goes as a sine pattern where it gradually increases, gradually comes down. Uh, things like that, which is a sinusoidal uh, nature. Now, for the next few slides, this is not AP content, but it is, I think, important to know as a human or anything else like that, um, that we have a limit of uh, frequencies that we can hear. Frequency is, you know, how often that disturbance is. Uh, that range is about 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. So a 20 hertz um, disturbance means that something has to flutter or push the air 20 times per second. Uh, this is actually a very low tone that I can't even produce. Um, my probably is, normal speaking voice is probably in the 300 hertz or something else like that. And it goes all the way up to 20,000 hertz. Um, so that's our high end. Um, sounds above 20,000 hertz are called ultrasonic. Ultra mean greater, uh, greater than sonic uh, in what we can hear. Uh, keep in mind, this is ultrasonic, not supersonic. Supersonic means faster than the speed of sound, not higher pitched. Uh, sounds below 20 hertz are infrasonic. So this is infra. And this is ultra beyond here. Okay. Uh, intensity. Um, I'm going to skip some of this, but uh, we don't. We have a certain perception of loudness. Okay. And we gauge that loudness um, on a scale called the decibel scale. And the reason we do this is because we have a problem. It takes a tenfold increase. Of energy and their intensity um, of intensity of the sound to for us to perceive a doubling in loudness intensity versus loudness intensity is actually the actual physics you know kind of measurement and loudness is what we perceive so you have to go ten times you know louder sorry ten times greater intensity to get twice uh, the perceived loudness okay and so we use something called a decibel scale. What does that look like? Um, somewhere around here, you know, you have a threshold of hearing at zero decibels. Um, very quiet sounds are at 10, whispers, classrooms, you know, but classrooms can get up to here 30 to 40 quite a bit. Uh, there is a big difference between 30 and 40. Um, quiet restaurant, conversation, noisy restaurant gets up in here vacuum cleaner, so on. Uh, somewhere around uh, here is where you have a, uh, 
NIHL, noise-induced hearing loss. If you continually get somewhere around here uh, exposure to this and greater, um, then you may not immediately lose hearing, but you will over time. Uh, somewhere around here, you have a threshold of pain, right? And this, these kind of sounds will actually uh, hurt and will produce, um, uh, yeah, so it actually has it at 130, somewhere around 120 and 130 is usually what it says, and uh, will actually produce pain and possibly uh, long-term hearing loss. Okay, um, so we're not going to go, we'll skip that right there. Uh, last thing in this chapter is Doppler effect. Um, I can't recall right now off the top of my head, but this is also another, uh, whether this is AP exam material, but this is a good thing to know. Uh, you hear an ambulance pass by, but it sounds different when it's heading towards you than it does when it's going away from you. And why is that? Well, it turns out that a higher pitch or higher frequency is made when it's moving towards you. In a uh, lower pitch or frequency, again, these are all frequencies, if you want to say that, when it's moving away from you. So the source of the sound is continuous. It's a, let's just say it's a, it's a siren, it's a, uh, let's say, the best ones are probably a train horn. If you go, if you're at a train intersection and you hear that sound, I uh, embarrass myself by making the sound, you hear the sound of a, right, as the train moves by fast while blowing its horn. That is a continuous sound, but to you, it sounds different. And the reason is why, uh, because the wave fronts, these little pressure zones, come more often to you when they're coming towards you and less often. It's because the source of the sound is moving. So let's look at some animations here, and hopefully they'll work. If I have a stationary source, right, it is actually you know, emitting sound waves outward. These are pressure, you know, each gray area is like a pressure front that moves outwards um, like so. If I start moving the source, see if it'll load. If I start moving the source, let's say to the right, right, you can see that as it moves to the right, it's showing, it's, grow, it's getting a uh, closer together to the right. Now, they're all moving away from the source at the same speed, but again, because it's moving to the right, it's kind of uh, compressing if you want to say that. Now, if I go faster and faster, with this load here, the, uh, I can reach the speed of sound itself. And if I'm going the speed of sound, then I am always riding that front of that pressure wave, right? So basically sound can't travel ahead of me because I'm going the same speed of sound, right? So every time I emit a sound, it goes backwards. So actually that effect gets worse and uh, worse as you go. Uh, if I break the speed of sound, which we can in you know, nice fast airplanes, then I can actually beat my sound wavefront ahead of me, right? So I'm still emitting sound, but I pass it, you know, after, you know, a second, you know, instantaneously, I'm now ahead of it uh, the entire time. That's what the Doppler effect really does, right? It actually, um, the, uh, the idea is that, go back here. So the idea is that uh, here, the, uh, oh, too far. Uh, you know, here, uh, I have a higher frequency if it's coming to, to me and a lower frequency if it's moving away, which makes that sound of a high pitch coming towards you and a low pitch moving away from you. So some of these things are necessary uh, for AP exam, some are not. Um, and um, so the next chapter we'll discuss how waves uh, interfere with each other um, and then create things called standing waves and how that affects uh, sound and music and that content is definitely uh, something